Greetings, subscribers! Pet Cemetery is a popular novel written by Stephen King, first published in 1983. Four different movies have been made based on this book, or spun off of other adaptations of this book. So today, I'd like to review all four of these films in the style of my two favorite critics growing up, Siskel and Ebert. These two had to review their thoughts on a movie, and in the end, break their entire opinion down to the limits of only two directions you can point your thumb in, up or down. Before I start reviewing, let me warn you that there will probably be spoilers, and let me also say that these are only my opinions, and I always have the right to change my mind someday. Otherwise, I'd like to get started. The 1989 film directed by Mary Lambert. This movie is quite popular with horror fans. It has an incredible story about family losing loved ones and the temptation to bring back the dead. There's some very relatable characters. It's both thought-provoking and emotional. This movie is not just based on a book by Stephen King, but King also wrote the screenplay himself. And although a film screenplay can never equal the depth of a book, King knew just how much was necessary to include in this movie. Director Mary Lambert did an all-around superb job in terms of storyboarding, getting chemistry going between the actors, and keeping the story moving at an entertaining pace. A lot of people praise Fred Gwynn's performance here as Judd Crandall, but I still don't think he's ever got the amount of credit he deserves here. I honestly believe that Fred Gwynn's performance here is amongst the best I've ever seen of any actor in any movie ever. The makeup department does a terrific job with gore effects and characters. For example, Victor Pascal was equally as creepy looking as, say, Freddy Krueger of A Nightmare on Elm Street, but this movie plays games with your head when one ghost is actually an angel trying to help the main characters, this killer zombie was once a cute and adorable kid, and the sickly sister is someone who you just don't know what to think of. Each of these characters looks gross and frightening, but each means something entirely different to the viewer. The score by Elliot Goldenthal is extremely chilling and effective, and fits the movie perfect. The Ramones' original song for this movie, played in the closing credits, happens to be one of my favorite songs ever. There are also some terrific sound effects. For example, that scene when we see the zombie of Timmy Baderman and hear the flies flying around the zombie, it just adds so much. This movie is more than just shocking while you're watching it, it also truly leaves you disturbed after the movie is over. But I think the most underappreciated aspect of this film is the locations. You really get the feel of moving into the small town of Ludlow, living in the rural country, in this old house, and going through the woods to find these secret spots. Just look on YouTube at all the amazing times fans have had going to these places. Especially make sure you watch my video. <laughs> it's quite ironic that these places could be so beautiful in reality, yet so terrifying in this movie. Although I will mention, I don't think the name Ludlow was ever actually heard in this movie. Is this film 100% perfect? No. There are a few issues. For example, some of the cast members could have given better performances, and there are a few details of the story which could have been made more clear. But does the good overall outweigh the bad here? Absolutely yes. In fact, yes to the point where I can honestly say this is amongst my favorite horror movies ever if not my actual number one favorite. Needless to say, I definitely vote thumbs up for this movie. In 1992, there was Pet Cemetery 2. This is indirect continuity with the 1989 film, although Stephen King has zero involvement. It's about a boy in LA whose parents grew up in Ludlow, and after the mother dies, the father decides to move back to Ludlow with his son. The main character of Jeff Matthews is played by actor Edward Furlong, who most people will recognize as John Connor from Terminator 2. This movie goes for a very different tone than the original, with mostly teenagers as the main characters, lots of hard rock music carrying the film's feel, a much larger number of deaths, and much faster pacing. This movie was not shot in Maine, but rather the state of Georgia. And when we see the old Creed House, the Pet Cemetery, the Micmac Ground, etc., it appears the location scouts and set designers didn't even try to find or make places that remotely resemble those of the original. Additionally, 
the father is a veterinarian, and when you see the street that his office is on, you ask yourself, is Ludlow supposed to have a downtown? It never has the feel of being in the same area as the original. All of this makes it really difficult to believe that Mary Lambert actually returned to direct this. The story here is simplified from the original. There's nothing like an angel trying to help the lead characters, the power of the Micmac rounds making things happen, nor questions about timing of when you bury someone, or anything like that. I don't think we ever even hear the word Micmac. It's just referred to as an Indian burying ground. This film offers zero ideas that were not already in the original. Now what do I like about this movie? I will say that actor Jared Rushton gives a strong and convincing performance as the bully Clyde Parker. Clancy Brown and Jason McGuire also give good performances as the stepfather and son who really don't get along. Their relationship seems very believable. I also really like the rock and roll soundtrack with songs by Drama Rama, L7, The Ramones, and more. But overall, the bad elements of this movie outweigh the good for me forcing me to vote thumbs down. In 2019, a reboot of the 1989 film was made, or perhaps you'd rather just call it a new adaptation of the book. It starred Jason Clarke and John Lithgow. The film basically starts off with the same story, but writers Matt Greenberg and Jeff Belur change as many details as possible, and most of these changes have no real benefit for the movie, but rather just seem like excuses for the filmmakers to say they were doing something different. The Creeds move to Maine from Boston instead of Chicago. Judd doesn't live across the road from the Creeds, but rather next door. Church the Cat first dies on Halloween Day instead of Thanksgiving. When Judd takes Lewis to the Micmac grounds, the rest of the family is home rather than being on vacation. It's set in 2019 instead of the 1980s, and for some reason, kids wear masks when they go to the pet cemetery. You get the point. Story aside, many other elements of this film don't work for me. There's nothing interesting about the friendship between Lewis and Judd. Actually, I'm not even sure if you really call them friends here or just acquaintances. Although I think John Lithgow is generally a well-crafted actor, I find him miscast here as he does not come across as a lifelong resident of a rural main town. Jason Clark as Lewis and Amy Cement as Rachel have surprisingly weak chemistry together. And I remember that shortly before this movie was released, a lot of people speculated that Jason Clark, who generally is a good actor, should do better with the role of Lewis Creed than Dale Midkiff did in the 1989 film, but I really just don't think that turned out to be the case. By the way, I would just like to mention that Jason Clark had previously played John Connor in Terminator Genesis. So this movie marked the second time that an actor who formerly played John Connor in a Terminator movie went on to play the lead role in a Pet Cemetery movie. As I said earlier, the 1989 movie left you disturbed after it was over, but I think this movie was only intended to shock you at the time you're watching it. And for me, it hardly succeeded. I felt many of the night scenes were surprisingly poorly lit, making it hard to be effective. While I talked about the incredible main scenery of the 1989 film, this one was shot shortly outside Montreal, although many of the scenes in the woods are clearly a studio set. The Micmac ground is not visually interesting at all. I also felt the houses used for Judd and the Creeds had too many trees around them, making it rather difficult to have a map in your head of where the houses and paths to the pet cemetery are in relation to each other. This is something that was done so beautifully in the first film. The way this movie ended felt more like a parody of horror than actual horror. And while I can enjoy tongue-in-cheek horror, parodies of horror, and stuff like that, it's not what I want from a Pet Cemetery movie. Now what did I like about this movie? As brief as it was, I really did appreciate the mention of the Wendigo, the Indian demon. That's an important part of the novel, which was basically left out of the first movie completely. I also thought the young actress Jate Lawrence gave a surprisingly strong performance as a young girl who loved her cat so much. I didn't like the script's twist that she instead of Gage was the one who died and came back as a zombie, but the actress was good at what she did. I hope to see Jate Lawrence in more films in the future. The only other thing I've ever seen her in was the series finale of Gotham when she played Jim Gordon's daughter Barbara. 
I think most Batman fans know that the character of Barbara Gordon will grow up to become Batgirl. Anyway, I'll conclude my thoughts on this film by letting you know I attended a special advanced screening of the movie about a week before it was officially released. There was free admission, free food, free drinks, they gave away free posters, the cast and crew were there for Q&A after the movie, and the animal trainer even brought the cat so fans could take pictures of themselves with the cat. And with all that, I still could not enjoy myself. That's how much I didn't like this movie. Needless to say, I vote thumbs down. Finally, in 2023, Pet Cemetery Bloodlines was released. This was a prequel to the 2019 reboot. It focused on Judd as a young man, and also the character of Timmy Baderman, who was the first person Judd knew to be buried in the Micmac ground and come back as an undead. Now, in the book in 1989 film, Timmy Baderman died in World War II. But since this movie was in continuity with the 2019 film, which was set that same year, this prequel story had to be changed to have Timmy Baderman die in 1969 during the Vietnam War. This movie starts off with Timmy's father, Bill Baderman, dragging Timmy's dead body to the Micmac ground with their dog Hendrix following. If you look in the background, you'll see piles of stones forming circular shapes, making the Micmac ground look closer to how it looked in the 1989 film than the 2019 one, despite which one this is supposed to be in continuity with. Although later in the film we get a better view during daylight, and it really doesn't look like either. Anyway, we see Timmy coming back to life after a matter of seconds of being buried in the ground, despite how long it takes everybody else buried there to come back. We also get a hint that Timmy kills his dog. It soon cuts to Judd and his girlfriend Norma. Anyone who's read the book knows that Norma goes on to marry Judd. These two miscast actors playing young Judd and Norma come across as anything but lifelong locals of a rural main town. They're getting ready to leave Ludlow forever and join the Peace Corps. Their plan goes wrong when they hit a bird and then see the zombie dog of Hendrix in front of them. They take Hendrix to the Bateman house where they see the zombie of Timmy. They can tell something is wrong, but they're not sure exactly what. Timmy somehow knows everybody's deepest secrets. This is a part of the book which was left out of all of the Pet Cemetery movies. Anyway, I'm not going to go over every detail, but I will say this film is slow moving, not much happens, and the suspense is ineffective. A lot of references that fans would want to see just are not here. For example, we see the Crandall home that we know Judd lives in his entire life, and there's no house across the road or next door that we know the Creeds will someday move into. A lot of elements we see about this area, like the hospital, diner, and hockey team, make this town feel too big to be the Ludlow we know from the novel. Like the 2019 reboot, this was shot outside Montreal, and it does not look like Maine. There's some clear flaws with how this movie holds together with the 2019 film, which it's supposed to be in direct continuity with. There's also an idea that in order to kill a zombie, you have to shoot them between the eyes. I don't remember that from the Pet Cemetery book. Sounds to me like it took some inspiration from George Romero's Dawn of the Dead. At the end, there's a part when some characters are in a house that's starting to burn down, and instead of trying to escape the house, they go down in the cellar to wait out the fire. How much sense does that make? Once they're down there, there's this whole piece that a zombie has created these elaborate underground tunnels which living characters have to crawl through. These tunnels turn into elaborate mazes. A lot of details in the climax are not only unexciting, but unclear what's even happening. Then for the very last line of the movie, Judd says, Stay the F out of Ludlow. How often do we know the character of Judd Crandall to use curses? Actually, in the book he does curse a few times, but only when he's quoting other people while telling a story. Not when he's articulating himself with his own words. There are a lot of cast members here that I recognize from other movies or TV shows. Bill Baderman is played by David Duchovny, who we all know is Mulder from The X-Files. Margie Washburn is played by Pam Greer, who I know from too many different things to count. Dan Crandall is played by Henry Thomas, best known as Elliot from E.T. And Kathy Crandall is played by Samantha Mathis, who I even recognize as Daisy from the Super Mario movie. I have liked these actors in other movies, however, none of them are very good here. 
David Duchovny makes it particularly difficult to believe that his character is going through the emotions he should be. I think calling this movie unnecessary to make is about as polite as I can be. Do I even need to say, I'm voting thumbs down for this movie? Okay, so those are all just my opinions and nothing more. And I'd like to hear the responses of you viewers. Do you agree with me? Disagree? Agree about some things but not others? Why? Please leave it all in the comments below. I hope to read new ideas that make me realize things about these films I never thought of before. I'd also like to reply to your comments and interact with you all. And before I end this video, I just want to say, a lot of fans of the book felt the entire story was already told in the book. And after the great 1989 movie, they say there's no reason to ever make another Pet Cemetery movie. But despite me voting thumbs down on every movie after the 1989 one, I actually disagree. I have an idea for a story which I think can make another truly great Pet Cemetery movie. The director of the 1989 film, Mary Lambert, said she had an idea for a movie about Ellie as an adult. Sounds similar to what Dr. Sleep was for The Shining. If such a movie ever happened, I'd surely see it, but I'm not immediately thrilled about the idea. And it's completely different than my idea for how to make another good Pet Cemetery movie. My idea is way too much to tell you now, but I could make a whole other video about it, like I once made a video called Hocus Pocus 2 Pitch, going over my ideas for a sequel to that, before the actual Hocus Pocus 2 came out. So if you'd like me to make a video about my idea for how to make another good Pet Cemetery movie, please let me know with a request in the comments below. I will keep count of how many requests I get, and if it reaches 100 requests, I will surely make the video. Otherwise, I hope you will please hit the like button, and if you've enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more of my videos, then please feel free to hit the subscribe button and hit the bell. I would love to have you. Thank you.